Okay. I'm trying to think of how to open this thing. Do they usually just say our guest today is, or how do they open their specials? Okay. (laughs) Yeah, because I get stuck on that all the time. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Radio is like magic. It is. <clears throat> American Family Radio. Joining me today is, I need to say my name. I am. Yes, that's right. <laughs> American Family Radio. I'm Natalie Stanfield. And joining me today is Katie Jaguer. And Katie, thanks for joining me today. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited. It's a pleasure to have you here. I got the honor and the privilege of hearing you in concert. And oh, um, thank you. <laughs> I'm already a fan of your music. I got, I got to read your book. And we're going to talk oh, some about that today. Thanks. Um, Katie has authored a book called Being the Fat Girl, and that took a lot of courage to, uh, first of all, title a book that, (laughs) second of all, talk about the struggles that went along with that, and uh, you may know Katie as the artist who sings the song Just By Your Mercy. Um, She also has an album out called Bringing Me Hope, but I wanted to introduce her a little bit more fully to you um, because... God is using Katie in such an awesome way to speak to people about being used of the Lord. And she has such an awesome story. I just wanted to bring her to you today and let you meet her on that level. So, (laughs) Katie, I just want you to uh, just be comfortable and and talk to me a little bit today. I'm comfortable. Okay. When I was reading your book, um, again, it's called Being the Fat Girl, My True Life Journey from Heartache to Triumph. Um, How old were you when you first started realizing that people were looking at you differently? You know, I I think I was about seven, um, and, and people just started making fun of me. And I think before that age, kids really don't don't know whether they're chubby, skinny, short, tall. You, you kind of, in the beginning, especially before school starts, just sort of think you're great mm-hmm. and always want your way because, you know, you know best. And, and then um, once elementary school got past that kindergarten, first grade stage, kids just started to be really cruel. And I guess... It was when somebody else first pointed it out to me that I really realized it in the first place. Well, what kind of insecurities did you have? Because looking at you now and listening to your music and listening to you talk, it's really hard to believe that you are anything other than this poised, beautiful young lady that you are right now. You know, gosh, my insecurities starting, I guess starting in the beginning, it was just mostly about just what I looked like. The fact that I looked different than other people. I think you spend a lot of time in your early childhood and your even your later childhood, just trying to blend in, like trying to be exactly like everybody else. And when you're not, it's just really difficult. But, you know, as time progressed, I think my insecurities became a lot more than just being the fat girl. It was, you know, am I going to be unlovable? Am I going to be able to accomplish anything? You know, do I have any talents? Do I have any abilities? You know, how is God going to use me? Because I guess I I felt like if I have this such this huge, um, what's the word, hurdle, to jump, then it's going to stop me from doing anything else that I want to do. So I think one insecurity just kind of snowballs into 50 other ones if you don't get under control. Well, you were literally tormented in school. Now, a lot of times we we gather our insecurities from the media or from what other people say. And and you're you are a plus size young lady. I am. (laughs) And um, and you're not embarrassed by that. And that's wonderful to be able to to talk to people and share that. But you were literally tormented by people in your school as you were growing up. And you're only 20 years old now. Right. So this is a very close memory for you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, like I said, it started, I was really young. I was about seven when it all started. And um, in the beginning, the kids just aren't real creative. You know, it was just like, Katie, you're fat, you're fat, you're fat over and over. And, you know, and that happened during my, most of my third grade year. And then starting in fourth grade, we had to change gym uniforms in front of each other and just in the locker room or whatever. And it was that year that I started to compare myself to other people and thought, you know, why do I look different than these girls? Why are why is my uniform so much bigger? And why how come everybody else is is not uncomfortable right now? And they're just running around doing what they have to do. And I feel so ashamed. You know, and then um, we moved to Nashville when I was 10. I, I grew up in New Jersey until I was just about 10. And when we moved to Nashville, 
um, there was a boy just in my class that then he he would start in things calling me hippo or heifer or whatever he came up with. But it was, he started to go beyond just the fat issue. He would call me I, I was a stupid hippo and I was a oh. an ugly hippo and those things where it was like like see it's not just fat anymore now it's all these other things that you're you're finding to pick on. And you know, and you were a Christian at this time. I was. So, how did you respond when these things happened? Um, I was really quiet. I really was. I just cried most of the time. I, and I would try so hard not to cry at school because I didn't want to look stupid. You know, that's all you want is just to not look stupid. And I would try so hard not to cry at school, and I would just get in the car some days, and my mom would pick me up, and I would just just collapse into tears the minute I got in the car, and I just spent a lot of time just soaking it up and never letting anybody know what was going on. Um, and there were a few times that I just cried at school and I, and then of course you're getting made fun of cause you're crying. And so it was just, gosh, it was such a, an ongoing struggle all the time. So was everybody in, was this boy kind of like the ringleader then? He was. And I, you know, I always did have a few friends that were nice, that were good to me. And then there was a lot of kids that were just kind of neutral, but there was him and there were days when, um, I would be called to leave school. You know, they call your name when you're young and, and he would start everybody cheering and get everybody clapping and oh. was glad that I was going and think where I was just, gosh, I, I can't even hardly talk about it sometimes because it's hard to, to feel so singled out, you know, at that age. But, um, it just, it gets worse as you get older, I think, because kids start to learn how to prey on your insecurity specifically. And, um, you know, I mean, this continued into high school for me. Do you think now, I mean, looking at you now and you see that what God has done with you and how he puts you in front of the very age group right. um, of the kids who tormented you mm-hmm. to to speak to them about these these very same issues? Because right now you're involved in a ministry that goes into the high schools and goes into the junior right. highs and, and talks to kids about self-esteem issues and talks to kids about um, about God's plan for their life. Right. You, you talk to youth groups all the time. Um, do you see now um, where the enemy may have been at work. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, I always say that if I hadn't had that struggle, if I was just thin and just went through school and nobody had found anything else to pick on and I just got through and no struggles, I wouldn't have a story to tell, you know. Mm -hmm. So I can definitely look back and see all the times where the enemy wanted me to give up and wanted me to believe the lies. And and I had the very supportive parents, and I, I was always in a Christian home. And so I, do, I wasn't getting a lot of opposition at home. So he had to, like, double it up for me at school. And, mm-hmm. and I can definitely see places where he just really wanted me to give up, and I just I wouldn't let, let him succeed. So you see where God used that to strengthen oh, you. Absolutely. You know, the Bible tells us, that, tells us that those things that the enemy meant for evil, that God is able to turn those things into good. Right. And absolutely. you're a living testament to that. Thank you. Well, you went through this horrible thing in high school and mm-hmm. in middle school where so you're just being assaulted daily. Um, did you ever think of quitting? Did you ever think of just giving up totally? You know, there were plenty of days where I think I thought I don't want to get out of bed and I don't want to go to school and I don't. But some little flicker of hope or light inside of me, you know, obviously I know it was the Holy Spirit. It was it was just God making sure I didn't give up. But something inside me was telling me you know what, you just got to get through it. Like there's got, there's got to be something better. Cause if you don't feel like it can get any worse then all it can get is better, you know? And while I do recognize that really it, it could have been horrible and I, I'm thankful to God for all the blessings in my life. Um, I also felt like, well, you know, there's gotta be something better. God wouldn't put me here for nothing. So I, I'm sure that that had to do with my parents and had to do with just the, the support that I did have and just his mercies, just amazing love to keep me going. But um, I definitely contemplated the idea of just giving up on everything that I knew, um, just leaving, like trying to start over, go to go somewhere else. But I knew that my problems would just follow me, that it was it was inside me as much as it was other people. Well, in your album, Bringing Me Hope, oddly enough, you said there was yeah. this little flicker of hope. Um your album or your project is called Bringing Me Hope. Um, tell me a little bit about what that song means to you. You know, um, when I first started to sing, I was involved in a project called um, Thread of Hope. And we would go into schools and do assemblies and, and got the students involved a little bit. And that was a great, like, really fun time in my life. But that had, had pretty much subsided by the time I went to record the album but that message of hope was always on my heart. And when I heard this song, I didn't write this one. We um, 
we just found it. And when I heard it, I was like, oh, my gosh. I, I was crying immediately. Just I thought, this is the song that I need to put my name on, is that th- those times when the world gives us nothing and has nothing to offer us and isn't giving us any kind of of um, validation, that God's there to give us hope and give us peace. And, you know, and so it was a very, very easy decision to make that the title track of the album and just go with it. Okay. Katie Jagir and Bringing Me Hope. <laughs> okay. Now, after you were in high school and you're being tormented by this young man, how far did he go as far as, uh, how far did he go as far as, let me start that again. While you were in high school um, and you were being tormented by this young man, and for whatever reason he has singled you out of the crowd and decided that you are his target, right. for how many years were you his target? Um, that particular boy actually apologized to me um, just before high school. I, I think it was, it was the beginning of eighth grade maybe, and actually sort of gave up. Um, and, and then just there would always somebody else to just pick up where he left off. But he it would, it, he just came at me every day for at least two or three years. And then by the time he sort of grew up and realized what he was doing was wrong, it had already been started. And my self-esteem was so low that I was just a very easy target because you didn't have to say much to me to get a reaction because I already felt so bad that it was easy to make me cry and it was easy to see the hurt on my face. And, and uh, you know, I was a really good student and I had a very supportive family and I was always real involved at school. And I think that for some people that was unfair you know it was like well why do you have all those things I'm going to make you feel bad you know so it wasn't necessarily the same person but there was just always something you know there's always somebody there was always that comment and And there was even people there to do it again right and there was even times where people didn't necessarily mean to hurt my feelings but the things that people say are just hurtful like um like I had a friend in high school who called me on the phone just to tell me you know um you're kind of pretty or whatever but if you were thin you'd be really hot I'm like, you know what? I don't really think I want my friends to think I'm hot. But even if I did, that was mean. Like, yeah. and I didn't, but at the time, it was almost like a compliment to me. I was like, well, at least he thinks I have the potential to be really beautiful. But he never said the word beautiful. And I don't know why I took that to mean he he might think I was beautiful when beautiful meant so much more and it was so much deeper. But, you know, it just, as we as I got older, it was different things. Maybe people weren't saying hippo, but there there was just always something, you know? So what do you think that the um, what do you think of the image makers in the magazines that are geared toward young people today? How do you think they affect your self esteem? Do you think that was part of it? Do you think that? Oh, absolutely, because you know, looking through magazines for me in high school, they had just started toward the end of my high school career to kind of have sections on what they called like real sized girls or every sized girls or whatever. But even those girls were smaller than I was, like. They call them plus size models, but they're still maybe a size 10, you know, and, uh, and I've never been a size 10, you know? So it it was just, it's very difficult for me. Even today, sometimes it's difficult and God has brought me so far, but I'm not perfect. And it's still difficult sometimes to look in a magazine and say, man, you know, like, um, looking through bride magazines now, I look at these dresses and I think I have no clue how I would look in that. I have no clue, you know? And I think that if we could have some more positive, realistic role models, and I'm not just talking plus size. If we just had models who don't have perfect hair and don't have perfect teeth and perfect skin, and if we could just show some of the just regular flaws, we might not have something so um, difficult to compare ourselves to. But I think a lot of our self-esteem issues come from our own internal struggles as much as they do from other people. You once wrote in your book that your father told you that you can't let your insecurities debilitate you. Right. And you have two choices. You can either accept it or you can change it. And you have to choose which mountain to climb. So when you're thinking of that, when you're thinking of the differences in yourself and what the media tells you to be, how do you choose? You know, I just realized this. Changing it is not easy. If, I, if it was just easy to be thin, oh, that's another thing people say. Well, if you don't like yourself, why don't you just lose weight? Well, it's like, oh, I'm sorry. Why didn't I think of that? Uh, if that was easy, I wouldn't be struggling and crying. But thanks. Um, you know, and it's just so oh, hard. You're the first person to tell me that. Thanks. Gosh, what a revelation. 
<laughs> but, you know, it's so hard to make a change, and it's really, really, really hard to accept yourself. But I find that making a change in my weight isn't going to be a thing that helps me get to the next step. It's not going to be a thing that helps me um, fulfill God's plan for my life because that's not what he's focused on. So I have to make that internal change and learn acceptance and learn, you know, and I don't think that it that if I lost weight, it would be like selling out or anything. I mean, I, I, I still try, you know, I still yeah. I still do hope that eventually I'll just be able to not have to. I can say I was the fat girl instead of I am the fat girl. But if I never get to that point, God is using me and God and um and I'm happy. I really am. I'm content and I'm happy. And I and I, I just don't let this this thing that everybody told me for so long was my my big imperfection. I don't let that be the thing that prevents me from accomplishing what God wants me to accomplish. Well, let's talk about that because you said in 10th grade, you were laying on your bed, bawling your eyes out, and you prayed, God, let me what? Wake up thin in the morning. I would just, oh gosh, that was just not just the one time, but there were several nights I would just lay there and be like, listen, here's the deal. If I can wake up thin in the morning, that would be kind of like a miracle, right? That would be miraculous. So then I can tell everybody you made me thin overnight, and then you'll get the glory, right? But thankfully, God's smarter than me. So what did he do instead? You know, he just put the right people in my life to say, look, here, I'm not going to make you thin in the morning. If you want to be thin, you're going to have to work at it like everybody else. But I'm going to put people in your life, and I'm going to give you opportunities to help you realize that that is not the only thing that's important. And that I'm going to use you regardless. So, you know, and and now I'm so thankful that he took that option. <laughs> so instead of making you thin, he put you on a path that other people are saying, how did this girl who doesn't look like the package, right. who doesn't look like your typical cookie cutter CCM artist or doesn't look like your typical cookie cutter package that we always see on the album cover, how did she get here? So how did you get here? Well, gosh, you know, at, at my lowest point, I was about 15 or 16, and it's just, I mean, that's a hard time for everybody. And I think no matter how beautiful and perfect you look, that's just a difficult time. But I had just gotten to a point where I accepted that God wasn't going to use me and God wasn't going to use my life, you know, that I would just be the fat girl and whatever I could do, I would just try to do it. But God wasn't going to be part of it because he didn't want me. But um, he put a woman in my life named Benita Mitchell who really just helped me turn everything around. Actually, my mom is this amazing cook. So everybody always comes to our house. And when our friends have friends in from out of town, they end up at our house. So we just had some come and dinner guests, and I didn't know who they were. But um, it turns out that Benita was on the road for 15 years with Stevie Wonder, who, um, you know, he's just a secular artist, but he's just kind of a legend in the music industry. And, yeah. and while she was out on the road, she had realized this is not what I want to do with my life. I want to be in music, but I want to find a young artist that I can find somebody who has something to say and develop them and help them. So when I met her, she asked me, just, what are you about? And I was like, well, like, what am I about? I don't know. Like, I'm 15. But I started to tell her about my commitment to abstinence and sexual purity and, and the reasons that I had committed to abstinence, not just because somebody had told me that I should, but because I knew it would save me heartache and it would save me, you know, from an unwanted pregnancy or, or some kind of nasty disease or whatever. And I knew it would save me from all those things. And and she said, okay, well, what else? And somebody piped up that I was a singer. And, I mean, I sang in church and, and tried little things. And, I, and my deepest desire was to be a singer, and I never had mentioned it to anybody, not even my parents. And I was very close to my parents, but I just had automatically assumed that wasn't a possibility for me. You'd already discounted yourself from that right. because of what you perceived already as right. your own flaw. Exactly. Yeah. And But when she met me, she said, you know what? I want you to sing to me. And so... I got my little track out of my room and I bought it at the Christian bookstore and 10,000 Angels Cried and I came downstairs and put it in and, and I played the CD and sang to her and I was so nervous. And she just said, you know what, I know that you're the person that God has had me waiting for. And he's, she said, if it's okay with you and if it's okay with your parents, I'd like to just work with you, just see what we can do. And she was living in Los Angeles and she said, I'm going to bring you out there and just see if we can get this ball rolling for you. And wow. that was five years ago in April. And the first thing that she had you do out in Los Angeles was cut your demo, which was? Which was my song, Saving Myself, which is about abstinence. Um, she she sort of wrote the shell of the song and helped, let me help fill in the details. So I was getting a lot of opportunities with writing and the whole nine yards. And uh, we recorded that demo. And the very next day, we marched it over to, to Stevie Wonder's home in Beverly Hills. 
And I, I was just awestruck by the whole thing because, you know, it's Beverly Hills. It's Rodeo <laughs> Drive. It's the Hollywood sign and passing all these things on the way there. And I was just freaking out. And uh, he gave me some encouragement that day that he just said, you know, you have a beautiful song and a beautiful voice and you can't be shy with a voice like that. And I thought, you know what, God, you took a blind man to tell me that I had a beautiful voice and that I needed to get out and use it. He didn't know that I was fat. He didn't know that I was insecure. He doesn't know me. Right. All he knows is what he heard. And if he doesn't know anything else, he knows music, you know. So I said, okay, you know, he's just a man, and I understand that, and he's just just another person. But that encouragement came from just the right source for me where it's like you can't see me. Right. And uh, I just said, okay, God, look, you brought me a 1,000, 2,000 miles away from my house with a stranger who just happened to take an interest in me, brought me to Beverly Hills. I'm meeting celebrity. Uh, like all these things, I could not have done this by myself. So I'm just going to trust that this is your plan for my life. And I'm just going to go with it, you know? That's awesome. So here's the song, Saving Myself. We'll play that. <laughs> now, <clears throat> now, God has used this song, Saving Myself, to open some awesome doors for you because this is also how he's opened a ministry for you to get into school systems. Right. To begin ministering to young people. Right, right in the beginning, as soon as we recorded Saving Myself, that that all happened in August, and by like October, we were in schools. Um, we had had we just came up with a couple other songs, and I would sing songs that were other people's and everything. And Benita had set up a school tour, and uh, we were able to go into public school systems, and I could bring the message of Christ as long as I I prefaced it by saying this is what I believe, and so I didn't even have to say this is one theory or. Or keep his name out of it or anything. I just had to say, my beliefs say this, 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 and this. And I had kids come up to me and say, well, you know, where did you get that? And who taught you that? And was able to to bring a salvation message into public schools just by saying, you know, we um, our program is about abstinence and self-esteem. Because those are always issues that the public school system is very open to sharing with their kids. So that was just a blessing and, and pretty much a miracle to go into a public school and be able to talk about Jesus the way I did. So you've gone from laying on your bed crying, feeling all alone and being made fun of and asking God to change you to him going, no, I made you this way for a reason and let me show you why. Right. So you once wrote that thin always equals beautiful. Now tell me how God changed that perspective in you. And what do you consider beautiful today? Oh, I definitely at, at one point thought you might be able to be not thin and okay looking, but if you want to be beautiful, you have to be thin. And I've just learned, I mean, especially just by traveling so much and just meeting so many different people and just coming across people that, that are so beautiful in all their different ways that I don't think that, that you can ever define it the way I thought you could. I thought you just said, well, if you're thin and you've got good teeth and good hair and good skin and you're tall, then you're beautiful, but you can't look at it like that. And, and I've started to realize, you know what, there are parts of me that are beautiful and there are parts of me they are ugly, and the parts that are ugly are my internal things that I need to work on. You know, it's like that. It's so much more dependent on who you are and about the decisions that you make, and you know, and our physical bodies are only very temporary. You know, it's just so temporary. When you put, you know, our seventy-five or eighty years we get on this earth against eternity, it's like we might as well not even do this earth part. You know, <laughs> so. To get so wrapped up in, in exactly what physical features look, you know, nicer together or whatever is just crazy. And so I've just learned that beauty is so much more defined by the character that you display and by the way you treat other people and by your heart's desires. And I feel like the reason I started to feel like I could find my own beauty and my own self-worth is because the more I do this, the more I realize that I don't care about getting famous or getting rich or putting out a bajillion albums and I don't care about the Grammys and I don't care about the Dove Awards. And I I care about things like last night I sang to a youth group and afterwards a girl came up to me in tears telling me about her struggles and telling me about the things that that kept her back and to be able to pray with her and put my hands on her shoulders and just pray that God would give her a vision for her life. That's, you know, that's what I care about. And it's in those moments when I realize that that's really where my heart is, that I start to feel beautiful because it's like, okay, I'm really following after you, God. I'm never going to be perfect, but I'm really hungry for the things that you want for me. And that to me is beautiful. That's awesome. 
So um, moving on to your album a little bit here and bringing me hope. You've got a song on here called Carry Me Jesus. Yeah. And I got to hear you perform this one. And I don't like to call it a performance because it was not. I mean, there is a there are some people that you watch when when they sing and and it's you know, there's a spotlight on them and they're singing. Um, and there are other people who you watch when they sing and and they are ministering before the Lord and engaging people with them in that. And that's what you do. And Thank and you. I was in there in the room with a bunch of youth and my sons were with me. And we got to be a part of that, and it was a really awesome experience. And this Carry Me Jesus was um, one of those songs that really moved some people. I saw tears in the audience. Oh. And um, so I want you to tell me a little bit about that. You know, Carry Me Jesus is exactly, it's about exactly what it sounds like it's about. Just those times when you just need Jesus to be stronger than you are, you know. When How I heard that get... song, I was actually really hesitant to put it on the album because there's so many parts in that song that are talking about how you're feeling like you're straying and feeling like, and I, I wasn't sure that it would be uplifting. And I really wanted the album to be hopeful and to be happy. And I went back and forth. And then I said, you know what, God, I think it is uplifting because it it's proof that Jesus will carry us through those times. It's just a little reminder that we don't ha- always have to be so strong, you know. And so I said, OK, I'll do it. You know, I'll put it on there. And, and I really prayed about it. And I really just felt like I needed to sing it. And, and you know, I went through those low periods where I knew I couldn't have carried myself, you know, where where Jesus and that little flicker of hope that he kept burning in my heart, that little ember was all that kept me going. And I know those are the times that he carried me. So I just, you know, I just really wanted this to be on the album so people could have, you know, another way to just be uplifted and comforted. That's an awesome song. Thank you. Hey, there's an interesting story behind one of the songs on your album. Yeah. Talk up a little more. Is that better? We're losing me. Okay, I may have to re-record some of my stuff then. All right. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Katie, in your book, you talk about um, you're very young to have experienced so much pain, first of all. Mm-hmm. And you're very young to have achieved such wisdom of the world. Oh, thank you. Um, but you've also experienced some profound loss. Mm-hmm. And some of that is reflected in some of your music. And can you talk about the song, I'll Find You? I can try. Okay. <laughs> um, I tried to sing it last night at my performance and didn't quite get through it. So, you know, my grandfather passed away in 2001, and he was only 58. So... Obviously, you're not thinking at 58 that you're going to lose somebody. And um, we got a call just early in the morning from his wife that he just had passed away the night before. And we were just devastated. My grandfather was a different person as a grandfather than he was as a father. When my parents and when my father was growing up, um, it was, he ran a very tight ship. And he was, you know, he was there. He was very present. But he just was strict and he ran into, well by the time I knew him he was like wearing Hawaiian shirts and <laughs> sneaking us candy like he was just crazy as a nut so um we really developed a good relationship and um when he passed away so suddenly it just gosh it caught us all so off guard and uh my dad was able to take the pain of that whole you know pain is always worse when it's a shock you right. know but he was able to take that pain and just write this beautiful song and then we sat down and really worked it out and exactly how I would do it and how I would sing it. And we just recorded it and we put it on the album as a tribute to my grandfather. I mean, that was, that was all it was for us. And it just so happened that he died um, about three months after nine 11. And so we didn't want to make a huge deal out of it at that point because we didn't want people to think we're trying to capitalize on anything. We really weren't. It was just a tribute to him. And, um, and now as time has gone on, it's become, the song that has probably the song that has the most impact on people because it just touches on a subject that's so personal. But um, just two months ago, my mother's father passed away, and uh, I'm able to talk about it today. I don't know. You know, it just hits you differently every day. But he was 81, and he had cancer in his liver. And we had a year and a half with him after his diagnosis, which was, you know, a mixed blessing because you you don't want to see him go. And the longer he's alive, the more attached you're getting. But It was also great to have that time with him, and he passed away just quickly. He was fine the night before, and then it was just one day until we we knew we were going to lose him. And 
So now that that pain for me was opened up again, but I'll find you is about that that reunion, you know, knowing that even though we have to live here on earth without them and even though we're sad and we miss them, that there is that time where we'll see them again and where we'll meet them in heaven. And, you know, you just have to hope that until then you can just get through it. And, um, you know, my family is coping now with this, with a new loss. And this summer, um, we lost my great aunt to cancer. My, my father's very close to her. So, you know, we've had a lot of loss in our family in just the last few years. My, uh, my grandfather's husband also passed away in between. So we just had a lot of loss, but I'll find you has brought us a lot of comfort and it's also brought perfect strangers, a lot of comfort. So I'm just thankful that God used that song, but mostly to me, it's just a tribute to the, you know, the man in my life that I love that had, you know, they had to die. They had to pass on. We all, we don't get to stay here forever, but you know, it's a nice way to remember them. And a reminder that you'll be together again. Right. Absolutely. Here's I'll find you from Katie Jaguar. And we already did carry me Jesus, didn't we? Yep. <laughs> okay. I like that one. Um, well, thank you. Okay. Now, another song that's on the album that's a little bit of a surprise is, or it was to me anyway, because um, you don't find too many old-fashioned hymns on contemporary albums. Right. <laughs> and I was kind of surprised to see It Is Well With My Soul um, in the traditional style right. on your album. Can you tell me how that ended up there? You know, I I keep saying it over and over, but my heart's message is hope. And I just feel like there's nothing more hopeful than being able to say whatever I have in my life, whatever life brings me, I have peace in my soul because because my sin is nailed to the cross and because I'll meet Jesus again when he comes back. And because we have all these promises from God, everything is can be peaceful for us. And, um, of course, I've gone through times where things were not happy in my mind and they weren't necessarily happy in my heart and I was confused and I was sad but something deep inside me always still had that peace you know the the Holy Spirit was just always there to to let me know I was going to get through it and you know and I picked it right away and it wasn't until after I picked it and I, I feel so um like an ignorant Christian for not knowing the story <laughs> but it wasn't until after I chose to sing it that I learned Horatio Spafford had written the song when his wife and his his children died in the shipwreck. You know, it's not like he wrote it in a good time of his life where he thought, well, everything's great with my soul. Right. You know, it was writing it from from his deepest pain. And I just thought, you know, the the age old words in this song have been passed down through the generations. And so many people's pain are reflected now in the song. But but our peace, too. So I thought I just want to be part of it. You know, I just want to be part of that legacy of this song. And. Plus, it's just my favorite. You know, it's just that you just don't get any better than the old hymns. And so we right away, my father and I, um, my father's my manager. And so we make a lot of decisions together. And we just decided we were just going to do an acoustic guitar and my voice. And we weren't going to really try to do too much instrumentation and stuff because the lyrics are just power enough. You yeah. Know? Well, this is It Is Well With My Soul from Katie Jaguar. Okay. Well, you've had an incredible, an incredible journey to get where you are from uh, coming through some very difficult times. And obviously you've spent a lot of alone time with God mm-hmm. and he has taken you through a lot of time um, learning to build an intimate trust with him. Right. Yeah, definitely. And uh, there's one of the songs on this album that, that really speaks to that. Yeah. And uh, can you tell me about that one? Yeah, this song is called My Beloved, and actually, my father kind of got the the vision for this song, too, and um, he writes a lot of material for me. He just knows me so well that he can write songs that he knows are close to my heart, and when he brought the song to me, it was unfinished, but it was just kind of the shell of the song, and we thought, I was like, how beautiful, you know? So we sat down together and worked out a melody, and it's just about those times where you're just, just you and God, where... I went through a lot of periods in my life where I thought I wasn't going to be loved in ever in a romantic way because all of my friends started all that dating stuff back in high school and, and I didn't have that, you know. And then just even after high school, I went into college and I was 18 and I was like kind of a legal adult and trying to like have some independence and that was still not part of my life. And and um, I just when I heard the song, I was just so moved by it because I thought that I don't need that. I don't need to find my validation in somebody else. I need to find my validation 
in God's love for me, and then all of the other stuff can come. So it's just a very just intimate love song about God knows the deepest recesses of your heart. He just knows every little part of you. And when we went into the studio, it didn't have a bridge at all. There was there was a bridge in the track where we knew we had to go, nah, 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 you know, we knew how it had to go, but there was no yeah. words. And just two seconds before I went into the studio, we, me, my father and I went back and forth a little. And then I said, how about my soul will always cling to you forever. I am yours. And he said, oh, OK. All right. So we just tried it. And it was just the first time I sang it. That was the first, you know, that was the first time we'd ever even heard it. And it just came out so beautiful and it just kind of candid and and uh, I love it. So that's definitely my intimate love song with God because he is all I need. And and um, you know what? I found some love here now. But um, before that point, this really just kept me going. It's an intimate love song to the Lord. Here's my beloved. Now, once you found this intimate love with the <laughs> Lord and, and you understood who you were to him and he was able to take you to a place that you didn't understand that you were meant to be and and make you into what he had desired for you to be all along. Right. Although you had an idea of what you thought you were supposed to be. I think right. that's so awesome because I, I still see the, the little 10th grader going, God, just please make me be this. And God's just, no, 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 Katie, I have this plan for you. So and, much better. <laughs> and now that he has you in this place, all of a sudden he has done something else in your life. That's awesome. And you know, this, this keeps coming to my mind where the Bible says to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, all Katie wanted was what for somebody to love me. And so then what <laughs> happened after this? So tell us what you happened. You know, now. I remember distinctly. It was January and it was a Wednesday night and I went up to the altar and I just got on my knees and I said, "God, I have realized that as far as love goes, it is not a matter of if, it's only a matter of when. I'm just going to trust that you're going to bring me the right person in the right time." And so I just, I'm giving it to you. Like, I'm going to stop thinking about it. I'm going to stop worrying about it. And I honestly had just turned it over to him. Mm -hmm. But there was this boy at my church that was kind of catching my eye. And I was friends with his sister, so I spent a lot of time with him. And I just thought, you know what? If he's interested, he will pursue me. If he feels like this is something that you want him to do, then he'll come after me. But I'm not going to go chasing after some boy. Mm -hmm. So I was praying that God would just make me like Rebecca in the Bible, where she was just she was watering camels right. when she found the love of her life. you mm -hmm. know. And I said, God, I just want to be watering camels. I want to be <laughs> singing. I want to be playing. I want to be doing drama. I want to be doing something for you. And then my husband just comes along. right? And so it was about five months later that this boy, Scott, that I had just been so noticing him but not wanting to do anything about it, called me and said, do you think um, it would be okay with your parents if I took you to the movies and – and I said, well, let me, you know, let me talk to my parents a little bit. So he came, picked me up and came in the house and said hello to my parents and all that. And we went to a movie. And that was in May of 2003. And May of this year, we were engaged on our two-year little dating anniversary. So it just, you know, it it's exciting in anybody's life when you find that love and when you get engaged. And But it's just, it's even more exciting to me to think I really didn't go after him. I really just had given it to God. And I had said, you know what? I'm noticing that he's there. I can't help but notice that he exists, right. but I'm not going to do anything about it. And God brought him into my life. And, you know, he was committed to abstinence and very supportive of my commitment to abstinence. And there's never even been a little bit of pressure from him. We're just committed together. And and he's so supportive of all this traveling that I have to do and all this singing and going and meeting new people and you know, right before I came here today, he said, okay, we'll talk about me. I said, okay. <laughs> so, um, he, and he's just a sweetheart, but, but I'm just thankful to God for him because that's another way that God showed me. I take care of you. I take care of the things that you need and not only things you need, but the things that you desire, I give them to you and think about if I had tried to rush that, you know, mm -hmm. I, I could still be dating somebody that was wrong for me, or I could just have made mistakes that I wish I hadn't made, but I was able to to meet him and say, you know what, I haven't even shared a kiss. You know, it's just, it'll just be me and you forever. And so that was nice. It was a nice little romantic love story there, and I could go on about him all day. But <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, though, because it happens in God's timing and God's way. That's awesome. Well, the last thing I want to cover with you um, as far as your music goes, um, and it's not on your Bringing Me Hope album, but it is the single that we play by you. 
Um, and it's called Just By Your Mercy. That's right. such a powerful cry for God's assistance. Um, and you've told us about th- these experiences that you've had with, with you know, people attacking you verbally and people actually, uh, people physically did things to you as far as like bringing you dog biscuits to yeah, school. I read no, that, that in your book. Horrible. That was horrible. It's a horrible thing to do to another child. And um, just the, the things that you, the struggles that you went through, um, do, did you read a lot of the Psalms before you chose this one? Because I noticed that you've got the byline on this song. So tell me a little bit about how you came to choose uh, Just By Your Mercy, or did you, let me start that again. Tell me a little bit about how you came to, to write this song. Well, actually, it's included on a project called Sing Unto the Lord, which is available on ChristianBook.com exclusively for right now. And um, my father actually gave me this opportunity and said, but if you want to be on the project, you have to write your own song because he was busy. My dad does production for other people and things, and he just doesn't have time to do everything, you know. And first I thought, well, then I just don't want to be on the project because <laughs> I don't know how to write a song by myself. But um, I thought, okay, well, this song is – this project is about – Songs based on Psalms. So I'm going to look through and I'll find a Psalm and I'm going to try this. And I started at Psalm 1 and I just went through. I got to Psalm 5 and I just got stuck on that line that says that it's by God's mercy. We're allowed to enter his house. But I thought, well, I don't want to look like I read five Psalms and made a decision. Like I want to really like look through this and see. So I kept reading and reading and there are so many beautiful Psalms. It's by far my favorite book of the Bible. So, you know, I had thought to do different things, but I just kept going back to it. And I said, you know what, God, I'm going to try it. So I sat down with Psalm five and I basically just took the lines of the Psalm and just fit them into a melody. And, but it was that just by your mercy part that I thought it is, it's everything that I do is just by God's mercy. It's the, it's by his mercy that I'm able to even be here. And it's by God's mercy that I can sing and that I can speak to people and minister. And I thought, you know, it's miraculous that he even allows us to be in his presence, but that speaks so much to his love and his, his generosity and his mercy and his grace. And I just thought, this is what I want to do. But at the time I just thought it would be a song on a project available on christianbook.com and that would be the extent of it. Um, but God really has taken that song now. Um, christianbook.com, the people who, who run that have decided to take my song, um, Just By Your Mercy, and make a whole other project out of it that will be available in the stores um, in the spring. And, you know, to just really kind of take it and run with it. And then we decided that it would be my next single to go to the radio. So when that happened, I was just amazed, just floored. But God just never fails me. You know, when I step out in faith and do something scared to death, he always helps and he always just – raises me up and shows me how he loves me and how all the things he wants to do for me. So it's just been so exciting. <laughs> I'm going to, oh, let's see. Let me read that. Well, Just By Your Mercy is by far one of my favorites. And it, and it never fails to grab me every time we, every time we play it. So um, this is Katie Jaguer and Just By Your Mercy. Is that song? I just where it needed to be in here because it was looking in. Okay, and then the last thing is um, we're going to wrap it up with your final words. I think we've covered everything. Is there anything else you can think of that we didn't get to? No, it was okay. very thorough, but we could just just some just words of encouragement kind okay. of stuff. Katie, I think you're an incredible young lady, and you've got an incredible ministry in Thank front of you. you. And um, I just wonder sometimes what you, if you ever stop and think, what would have happened if God had answered your prayer the way you wanted Him to? Oh gosh, yeah. You know what? I'm so thankful that He just let it be, and that He just said, "Okay, I'm going to bring you people to help you accept yourself. I'm not going to change your body for you. What good was that going to do? Because my heart has been so changed by by all the events that have happened." since he didn't answer that prayer the way I thought I wanted him to. But, you know, I'm just, I look back and I realize if it wasn't my weight, it would have been something else because everybody has a struggle. You know, everybody has that thing. Either they're too fat, they're too thin, they're too tall, they don't feel intelligent enough, they don't feel like they have any talent, or they never can seem to get close enough to God. Whatever it is that you struggle with, everybody has something. 
And I feel like my struggles have enabled me to be compassionate to other people's struggles and say, you know what, whatever it is that you struggle with, God has a plan for you. And your plan is as amazing as my plan. And maybe your plan doesn't include a trip to Beverly Hills and traveling all over the world or whatever, but your plan includes just as amazing, just as many miracles because God is good and God doesn't love me more than he loves you. So if he'll do this for me, he'll do it for you. That's awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. I think we're done. I don't think I need to say anything else after that. <laughs> like, except thanks for being with us or something. Should I just say? Yeah. Thanks for being here. <laughs>